Chapter 26 of Taking the Bastille. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton, Atlanta, Georgia. www.russellericnewton.com. Taking the Bastille by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 26 Belay's Sorrow. At a time when the queen and her consort were leaving Versailles, never more to return under its roof, the following scene was taking place in one of its inner yards, damp with the rain which a bitter fall gale was beginning to dry up. Over a dead body, a man clad in black was bending. A man in the royal lifeguard's uniform knelt on the other side. Three paces off stood a third person with fixed eyes and closed hands. The body was of a young man, not more than twenty-three, all of whose blood seemed to have poured out through ghastly wounds in the head and chest. His furrowed and livid white breast appeared yet to heave with the disdainful breath of hopeless defense. The head thrown back and the mouth open in pain and anger recalled the fine figure of speech of the ancient Romans, and with a long-drawn wail the spirit fled to the abode of shades. The man in black was Gilbert, the lifeguard's officer, Count Charny, the bystander, Billet. The corpse was Viscount Valence Charny's. Gilbert regarded it with that fixed gaze which suspends the fleeing soul in the dying and seems in the dead able to recall the fled one. Cold and rigid, he is dead, and really dead, he said at last. Charny uttered a hoarse groan, and, pressing the corpse in his arms, emitted so heart-rending a sob that the physician shuddered, and Belay went off a little to hide his head in a corner of the quadrangle. Suddenly, the mourner raised the body, set it against the wall in a sitting posture, and slowly came away, but looking to see if it would not revive and follow him. Gilbert remained on one knee, resting his chin on his hand thoughtfully, appalled, and motionless. Then Belay quitted the nook and came to him, saying, as he no longer heard the wails of the Count which had made his heart ache, Alas, Dr. Gilbert, this is really civil war, and what you foretold is coming to pass, only the trouble comes sooner than I believed, and perhaps sooner than you calculated. I've seen villains slaughter wicked men. I've trembled in all my limbs and felt a horror for such monsters, but yet the men who were killed so far were worthless. Now, as you predicted, they're killing honest folk. They've killed Viscount Charny. I do not shudder, but I grieve. I do not feel so much horror for the murders as fear for myself. The young gentleman has been foully done to death, for he was only a soldier and fought. He ought not to have been butchered. He uttered a sigh from his vitals. To think that I knew him when a child, he continued. I can see him now, riding along on his little gray pony, carrying bread round to the poor on behalf of his mother. He was a fine pink and white-faced child, with big blue eyes who was always laughing. Well, it is queer, since I have seen him laying there, bleeding and disfigured. It's no longer a corpse that I think of him, but as the pretty boy with the basket on his left arm and a purse in his right hand. Really, Dr. Gilbert, I believe that I've had enough of this kind of thing, and I do not care to see any more of it, for, as all of you foretold is a coming true, I shall be seeing you die, and then— Be quiet, Belay, said the physician, shaking his head gently. My hour has not struck. But mayhap mine has. Down yonder the harvest is rotting, the land is laying unplowed, and my family languishes whom I love and ten times more fondly, since I have seen this corp for which his family will weep. What are you driving at, Belay? Do you suppose that I am going to pity your fate? Oh, no, answered the farmer simply. But as I must cry out when I am in pain, and as crying out leads to nothing, I want to relieve myself in my own way. In short, I want to go home on my farm, Master Gilbert. What, again? Look ye. A voice down there is calling me home. That voice is prompting you to desertion, Belay. 
I'm no soldier to desert, sir. What you want to do is worse than desertion in a soldier. I should like that explained, doctor. You come to Paris to overthrow an old house, and you turn away before the building is down? For fear it will tumble on my friends? Yes, doctor. Rather, to save yourself. Why? There's no log against taking care of number one, said Belay. A pretty calculation, as if the stones might not bound in falling and rolling, to kill the runaway at a distance. Oh, you know I'm not to be scared. Then you will remain, for I have need of you here, my dear Belay. My folks also have need of me at home. Belay, Belay, I thought you had agreed with me that a man has no home when he loves his country. I should like to know if you would talk like that if your son Sebastian lay there in that young gentleman's stead. He pointed to the corpse. Belay, a day will come when my son will see me laid out like that, was the stoical response. So much the worse for you, doctor, if he is as cold as you over it. I hope he will bear it better than me, and be all the family from having had my example. Then you want to inure the youth to seeing blood flow. At his tender age, to be accustomed to fires, murders, gibbets, riots, night attacks, to see queens insulted and kings badgered, and when he is cool like you, and steel like a sword blade, do you expect he'll love and respect you? No. I do not want him to see any such sights, which is why I have sent him down to villers Cotterets, along with Ange Pitou, though I almost regret it at present. You say you're sorry for it today? Why today? Because he would have seen the fable of the lion and the mouse put in action, which would be reality to him henceforth. What do you mean, Dr. Gilbert? I say that he would have seen a brave... An honest farmer come to town, one who can neither read or write, who never dreamed that his life could have any influence, good or bad, over the highest destinies. He would have seen that this man, who was about to quit Perry, as he wishes once more to do, contribute efficaciously towards saving the king, the queen, and the two royal children. How is this, Dr. Gilbert? asked Billet, staring. How sublimely innocent you are, I will tell you. Did you not awake at the first noise in the night, guess the tumult was in tempest about to break on the royal residence, and run to arouse General Lafayette, for the general was sleeping? Well, that was natural enough. He'd been riding for about twelve hours. He'd been abed for four and twenty. You led him to the palace, continued Gilbert. You led him into the thick of the scoundrels, crying, Back, villains! The revenger is upon ye! That's right enough, I did that. Well, Belay, my friend, you see that you have great compensation. Though you could not prevent this young gentleman from being betrayed, you did perhaps stay the great crime of the slaughter of the royal family. Ingrate, why you would leave your country's service just when such a mighty reward was yours. But who would know anything about it when I never suspected it myself? You and I, Belay, is that not enough? The farmer meditated for a while, before he said, as he laid out his hand to the physician, I guess you are right, doctor, but, you know, man is a weak, selfish, unsteady creature. You're the only one who is just the other style. What made you so? Misfortune, replied the other, with a smile filled with more grief than a sob. Lord, how singular. I thought misfortune soured a man. Weak men, yes. But if I were to meet misfortune, and it was to make me wicked? You may meet misfortune, but you will never become wicked. I answer for that. Then, sighed Billet, I shall stay and see the game out. But I shall show the white feather more than once, like this. But I shall be at hand to uphold you. So be it, said the farmer, throwing a lazy look on Viscount Charny's body which servants came to remove, he said, What a vastly pretty boy he was, with his laughing eye, when he rode along on his little gray with the basket and the purse. Poor little Master Charney. Poor Belay. He had not the mesmerous prophetic soul, and he could not dream what events we have to trace, now that the king and queen have started to Paris, to follow the road marked by the revolution's red-hot plowshare. 
Now that Sharni begins to see what a winsome and noble wife he has, now that our minor characters are standing out, now that poor Ange Pitou, quitting Paris with regret, is going to play a grand part in the drama of his own country, our romance is but well on the way. We shall meet our dear old friends, and alas, we shall find our stubborn old enemies in the pages of the continuation to this book under the title, The Hero of the People. The End End of Chapter 26 Recording by Russell Newton, Atlanta, Georgia www.russellericnewton.com End of Taking the Bastille by Alexander Dumas